Yo, what up? We back with CT's RPT, Real Prison Talk with Wes. And today I want to talk a little bit about prison violence. Now, I know we all either heard, seen, or some of us participated in some form of prison violence. But today I want to get a little bit deeper and touch on some of the underlying issues and hopefully educate somebody a little bit about the prison lifestyle. Because I feel like if I'm not educating or informing people, then what am I doing? I'm not just coming on here to glorify prison or to try to sound gangster because for one, my work speaks for itself. And anybody that knows me or seen any of my movies already know what it is. So I ain't even going to get into all of that. So anyway, according to Wikipedia, prison violence is a daily occurrence due to the diverse inmates with varied criminal backgrounds and penitentiaries. The three different types of prison attacks are inmate on inmate, inmate on guard, and self-inflicted. I myself am no stranger to none of them. Not saying that I've done all of them, but I'm just saying I'm familiar with all of them. Gang violence, overcrowding, and just the prison design also contributes to a lot of the violent attacks that go down in prison. Wikipedia says that one out of every five inmates, or 20%, have become a victim of three forms of violence. And they break down the three forms as such. Instrumental violence, which is the most commonly known, are premeditated attacks. They're calculated. They're planned out. They're basically like, for an example, if you're in a gang block and one affiliation attacks another, the warden will shut the unit down, put the whole block on lockdown for about a week in order to prevent a war. But what he's actually doing is giving rival gangs more time to reflect and plan out their next attack. So as soon as we come off of one lockdown, we go right back on another because He's giving dudes more than enough time to not only calculate their plans, but to build up the courage to execute them. And that usually, that's usually the cycle until either one or two things happen, you know. Every time there's a deal, every time there's a situation, the dudes that was involved goes to the box. Depending on the seriousness of the situation, they might even go to another jail. They definitely going to get split up, so somebody will be going to another jail. Usually, I don't think this is DOC's rule of thumb, but according to a lot of the inmates, they say the loser gets transferred. So, the cycle will continue until either one affiliation decides to extend the olive branch and reconcile because a lot of a lot of the issues are, are in jail are solved without DOC. We solve them ourselves. Rarely what happens and these are rare occasions DOC will do their own investigation and throughout their, that investigation they'll find the people that are the key factors and They'll come and pick them out. No one without these key factors, this affiliation will not operate. 
that's rare because usually the way gangs are designed, there will be there's always someone else that should be ready to step up and take that that position. But that's instrumental violence, you know, the violence that's calculated and planned out. And that, I take back the fact that I said that's the most common. That's the most common to me. So to me, coming in a close second would be what's called expressive violence. Expressive violence is more of a a spontaneous attack. That's usually a more responsive attack that occurs when the victim is provoked or threatened. So, like a quick example of that is when I was in McDougal. I had a friend of mine named Los, Spanish kid from New Haven. He was in jail for murder. And he actually, he, he came to jail for one murder. And he ended up killing, I think, two or three other people while he was locked up. I don't remember the exact number, if it was two or three. But I know the third one was an expressive violence because it was a spontaneous attack. It was, he was threatened. He was in a block with a dude that was much bigger than him that was trying to extort him. And after numerous times of trying to get the officers in the block to move him, he ended up stabbing the dude in the neck. He just couldn't take it no more. He killed the dude. And that is a exact form of uh, expressive violence. The third form of violence is self, self-harm. self And that, you know, you see that a lot too. Self-harm, that's really considered to be a psychological act. A lot of guys in prison suffer from many different mental disorders like depression or anxiety or whatever. And without the proper psychiatric attention, they may become detrimental to themselves or others. So when you add in influences from the environment that they live in or the people that live in that environment or that's in that environment that they have to live in or the time that they're sentenced to, then you have some people that get to their breaking point and feel they can't, I can't take it anymore and I don't want to be, I don't want this life anymore. So I want to check out. That's probably the reason why when you sentenced to a significant amount of time, the first thing they have you do before you, when you come back from court, before you go to the block, because I, they did this to me. I did three years. I did a three year bid. I didn't have to speak to nobody. But this last bid I just got was to 12. I just got sent, I had got sentenced to 12 years. And on my way back from court, they stopped me before I went into the, the unit that I lived in. They said, oh no, Smith. You got to go over there and talk to mental health. And I'm like, talk to mental health? Why well, got to talk to mental health? Well, I ain't never have to talk to mental health because at the time, I looked at that as some weirdo, like a weirdo move, having to talk to mental health or me being weak. Not knowing that there's dudes that, it ain't about being weak. It ain't about being a weirdo. It's about there's dudes that need the help. And since I didn't need the help, I looked down on the dudes that did. So when they sent me into the mental health, I felt some type of way. So I go in there and the lady, like, first thing she asked you, first question they asked you, like, are you, she said, you've been sentenced to over a decade of time, Mr. Smith. Do you feel like hurting yourself or others? And I'm like, no, I don't even think I belong here. Like, let me go. There was a stigma on it, you know, and, and, and I looked at it as dudes that go to mental health, they need medication, and I'm not one of these zombies that y'all got lying around here. But without that help, you got dudes that feel get to their breaking point, and that's why 
the suicide rate in prison is higher than anywhere else. And you can look that up too. I found that on Wikipedia also. That dudes is offering themselves in prison more than anywhere else. And just because I was strong enough to not even think to go that route doesn't mean that I don't understand how somebody could think like that. I don't think like that, but I could understand how maybe you're not as strong mentally as I am. Maybe you got a little something else going on in your situation that I don't. And you just get to the point where you, you know what, I can't take it no more. And that is also a form of prison violence, self-help, you know. And you got dudes, <laughs> you got dudes that, that, that self, self-harm, self not self-help, I mean. You got dudes that self-harm themselves just to get what they want. I knew, I knew when I was in a box, there was a dude in the box next to me that would cut himself. Smear the blood all over everything, all over his face. It might be a little cut, but he knew where to cut himself to where he would bleed a lot at. And he would do that just so he could get his way, whether he wanted to go to the to the uh, hospital uh, unit where he could lay up and watch TV, which is better than being in a box, but it wasn't, shit, it wasn't that serious to me to where I'm going to harm myself to get there. But, you know, everybody's... Everybody's different up top, you know, but self-harm is definitely one of the prison violence that I've witnessed. I've seen dudes kill themselves. I was in the box. My first time in the box, kid hung himself. And it was like, it was sad, you know, the nurses that came, they were all crying and they didn't even know him. It's just, you know, death is a sad thing, you know, so... I just wanted to give a little bit on, on prison violence, you know, because I wanted to match up what I've witnessed with what I've read. If you haven't, show me some love. Hit the subscribe button. If you have any questions, follow me at wes.smith.129. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Wes Smith, Wes.Smith without the T, Wes without the T. And I wasn't going to bring this up, but it's been eating me. I got my first dislike on my video yesterday about the prison food. So whoever that person is, whatever you did, whatever you disliked about the show, I would like to have a conversation with you about that. So you can hit me up on Instagram, wes.smith.129. Say whatever you got to say. Or you can leave a message right here on this show. Until next time, peace.